This film was made in the year 2003. As a new millennium dawns for planet Earth, we look back on the events which finally unlocked a mystery that has haunted humankind since time began. July 2001. Radio astronomers from the SETI Society, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, were combing the sky for signs of alien life. Armed with radio telescopes, SETI scientists scanned the vast reaches of space, hoping to detect a deliberate signal of some kind amid all the cosmic noise. Senior scientist Professor Jane Lascelles. A radio telescope basically works like an enormous antenna and it uh, is searching the galaxy for radio waves and um, these radio waves are caused by an enormous number of naturally occurring phenomenon but the search for extraterrestrial intelligence focuses on radio signals that are not naturally occurring that are being obviously deliberately transmitted and um, that could only be you know, intelligent life forms on another planet, um, aliens, if you will. On July the 23rd, the SETI astronomers were just beginning a new space survey based at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. Signal engineer Dr. Don Merrick was working at the telescope in the early hours of the morning. I remember that it was uh, very late. It was about 3 a.m. Uh, we had just repositioned the telescope. And... Uh, I got a, a peek out of the noise uh, signal coming through on my, my station. Um, now, this is not so unusual. It happens, you know, fairly often. The standard procedure is to confirm it with another telescope. Merrick contacted fellow astronomers in Massachusetts. Now, two sets of scientists were tuned into the same frequency. And it was about a half hour later, I got an email that said something like, uh, what the hell is that? And, um, you know, and that's when I knew that we had something remarkable. They knew the signal had to be taken seriously and began standard tests to make sure it was genuine. They moved their telescopes away from the frequency and the signal disappeared. They brought them back and the signal returned. Then the computers were checked for faults. Everything was working. At that point, I contacted my colleagues, and they contacted the Owens Valley Observatory in California and the Arecibo uh, Telescope in Puerto Rico, which is the largest in the world. Um, we asked them to tune in to the same frequency, and uh, the information came back positive. They, uh, they had the same signal. I hadn't slept in days, and I was uh, wide awake, I can tell you that. With three different telescopes receiving the same signal from the same point in the sky, and showing no natural characteristics. Astronomers were convinced the message was extraterrestrial. Email went out to the top scientists in the field, but no one knew what the signal was saying. None of the telescopes were sensitive enough to read it clearly. The scientists were reluctant to go public with their news, but events were already overtaking them. I think that under ideal circumstances, we would have worked on that signal for some time. But within a few days, the news leaked out. And as you know, in a computer age, it's virtually impossible to keep anything a secret. One of the most startling discoveries of the century. And the source of the leak was two computer hackers in San Francisco who'd entered a local university network. An avalanche of email among astronomers was their clue that something was up. We were hacking into these university internet accounts, reading their emails, and we came across these string of messages between these radio astronomers. And these guys were jazzed about something. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. So I took these messages and I propagated them across the internet into different web pages. I know the scientific community says they intended all along to give the public this information, but I don't buy it. You know, these guys, politicians, scientists, they've lied to us before, they'll lie to us again. They're not about to stop. It. 
As soon as the hackers began spreading the email around the internet, it was picked up by the military. A short time later, SETI astronomer Ben Klatsky received a call from the Pentagon. When they first called, uh, they said that they'd heard that we'd received some interesting signals and asked if we were willing to confirm, all pretty low key. And then they wanted to know, uh, did we know how far away the signals were coming from? And if they were coming from something moving, uh, say a spaceship, uh, I'm sure national security was their concern. But I told them just to relax and wait for our press conference. The astronomers knew they had to go public fast with their discovery, or someone else would. But as Greg Silverman found out, the military was already way ahead of them. At exactly 6 o'clock on the Monday morning, we lost our signal to interference completely. We were wiped out. And at first we thought it was just a problem with the telescope, then we started calling around and we found out it had happened to everybody. As it turned out, the military had managed to jam that particular frequency for every single radio telescope in the world. On August the 5th, 2001, with the US military in a state of high alert, it fell to Professor Jane Lascelles to inform the world of their historic discovery. I think that day gave all of us pretty strange feeling. You know, every other great revolution in human knowledge is spread gradually through society. But here we were, in the age of instant communications, walking out and saying to the world, hey guys, we've got some news that changes everything. Astronomers from the SETI Society, working at the Green Bank Observatory, West Virginia, identified a radio signal which they had reason to believe originated from an extraterrestrial technology. There was instant bedlam. Lascelles struggled to continue. The signal originates from Gliese 1116, a double star system, 17 light years. Lascelles managed to explain that the other observatories had been given sufficient information to undertake their own research into the weak and distant signal. But the journalists had little interest in the scientific protocol. They wanted headlines. And the first question they asked Don Merrick was why the signal hadn't been decoded. The signal itself is actually quite weak. Um, what that means is that we're going to have to build some more telescopes, uh, at least one, probably uh, several dozen, dozens maybe, in order to properly receive the signal. Uh, this is going to take some time and depends on funding, actually. Um, it, and, and at that point, we'll be able to begin decoding the messages. And then came the first signs of panic. In, uh, in, Dr. Merrick, yes. how do you know that the aliens are not headed this way right now? There is no danger of that whatsoever. It, we cruise the solar system in our spacecraft at about 36,000 miles per hour. So um, they may be able to travel faster than us, but, but even at the speed of light, it would take them 17 years. So you've got this signal that you're not receiving properly. You can't decode it. Do you really expect the public to believe you? Even while the press conference was still taking place, telescopes of every kind all over the world were turning to the same point in the sky. In the face of fierce international protest, the US military had now turned off their jamming device. But even then, only a very few telescopes were powerful enough to pick up the signal and separate it from all the surrounding noise. As the news began to spread, people reacted with amazement and delight. Tonight on KBTV World News, scientists say E.T. is calling. I was shocked. I read it in the paper this morning. You did? Yes. And you feel shocked? Yes, I am. <laughs> Why are you so shocked? I'm just shocked that it happened. I mean, to read that, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know anything was going on. Yeah, I believe that, that discovering that the possibility of other people in this universe will, uh, will make us realize that we are not the only people or things here and make us really what we are, a small part of a very big 
universe. Actually, I'd always thought that there were some intelligent beings out there. I mean, I wanted to know what makes us think that we're so superior that we're the only ones here. It's glad. I'm glad to hear that. But the financial community was not nearly so upbeat. Wall Street had its worst day since the crash of 87, plunging a free-falling 596 points. Concerned, but not alarmed, at the unusual amount of activity they experienced after yesterday's historic announcement. Although there was a surge in withdrawals from... The scientists became celebrities overnight. We're going to have to get used to that other strange monster, the press pack. And the question all these journalists are asking is, just who and what are these alien creatures? Despite the astronomers' insistence that the signal had come from trillions of miles away, many reports gave the impression aliens would be arriving any minute. The media was obsessed with what the creatures might look like. But above all, they wanted to know, was the Earth in danger? How do you defend against an extraterrestrial attack? The answer might lie with the Star Wars technology developed in the 1980s to counter Soviet nuclear missiles. If the lasers from this satellite defense were turned outward towards space, might they be able to counter any extraterrestrial attack? Over the days that followed, there was growing evidence of confusion and misunderstanding among the public and the press. Reports of UFOs and alien contacts soared. I could see the little legs on it, like little pods on the bottom. It was a saucer-shaped deal. i seen it. I know what I've seen. I'm a believer in it. A number of doctors and psychologists today expressed concern about the possible destabilizing effects the discovery of aliens might have upon people they consider psychologically susceptible. One of the journalists who attended SETI's press conference was Cheryl Davis, a freelance writer with a special interest in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Davis recalls what happened when she returned home on the evening of the astronomer's announcement. I remember that night. I'd just been given this monumental news and the world just seemed so normal to me. I guess I just figured that when we finally contacted alien life from outer space, they would just come right down to the White House and plant themselves on the lawn. So I come in, I'm on this daze from this press conference, and I'm listening to my answering machine, and there's this one really bizarre one. I kept it. It was so strange. I mean, he talked about Roswell. Maybe it's time to think about Roswell again, Miss Davis. Davis knew Roswell as a town where some people claimed a UFO had crash-landed back in 1947. She was also aware that the U.S. Air Force had recently offered an explanation for what had really happened at Roswell all those years ago. They said the supposed UFO had actually been a crashed surveillance balloon from a secret program known as Project Mogul. Davis immediately contacted Bill Gregory, a journalist who had worked on the Mogul story, and reported her phone message. You know, whenever you heard anything that came out of Roswell, it was usually some crazy theory about aliens or a UFO sighting. But when Cheryl called me about a signal, plus what I'd been reading in the Mogul report, I thought, maybe I had to take one more look down here. Gregory knew that the top secret Project Mogul had operated from Holloman Air Force Base about 150 miles from Roswell. He soon discovered that one of the project's research engineers was still alive and living in the area. His name was Walter Drexler. None of us engineers really knew what was going on exactly, uh, but I knew there was an infrared sensor on board, and uh, if the test worked, we'd have one of those balloons uh, along the border of the Soviet Union. Maybe it would uh, detect a nuclear missile test or something like that. According to Drexler, the balloon must have detected something the military wanted to keep top secret. I heard that the balloon had crashed, and uh, I figured uh, it must have picked up something before it crashed, because the base went on. And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge that uh, it had picked up something from uh, 
Not there. Drexler's extraordinary revelation that a signal had been received from outer space threw the Roswell incident into a completely new light. The talk had always been of crashed UFOs, but this seemed every bit as incredible. A Cold War spy balloon detecting an extraterrestrial communication. The question Gregory now needed to answer was this. Was there any connection between the Roswell signal and the signal received by SETI astronomers almost 50 years later? Thousands of Eureka-themed products to be in the shops by Christmas. Perhaps when you're weary of civil war, you're bound to find flying saucers more appealing than flying warplanes. In Russia, already beset by civil war, some saw the signal as a sign of deliverance, and false UFO sightings began to proliferate. This man told us, I thought at first it must have been my hangover, but I hadn't been drinking. There were these bright lights in the sky hovering right above me. Meanwhile, countries of the Middle East reacted with ambivalence. Islamic leaders rejoiced at finding the universe contained more of God's creatures. But governments hostile to America dismissed the reports of extraterrestrial communications as a trick, an excuse for the US military to place weapons of mass destruction wherever it pleased. In the face of mounting international protest, the UN went into emergency session. On the agenda was how the Earth should respond. Should the UN initiate an international space program? And was the U.S. controlling the contact with the aliens? Two months later, they were still arguing. Three months after the discovery of the signal, the American public was frustrated at the lack of progress. An impatient Congress demanded the U.S. take the lead in this new space race. The pressure for unilateral action came as no surprise to NASA's research policy advisor, Rosemary Gallo. I've always believed that this kind of discovery would generate a lot of enthusiasm, both on the part of the public and for the scientific community. What it gave us was a concrete focus for all kinds of space research. The scientific community felt strongly that the signal should not belong to anyone. And while they desperately needed better telescopes, most scientists wanted to avoid the politics of where the money came from the US, the UN, or elsewhere. Finally, on the 13th of October, 2001, Congress decided the matter with a huge reallocation of funds for extraterrestrial research. The money came from three bodies, NASA, the military, and the National Science Foundation. And it amounted to about $20 billion each year for 10 years. What it covered was space exploration, manned and unmanned, a new telescope program, defense systems, and genetic engineering. It was inevitable that genetic engineering would become a part of the new initiative. If human beings were ever going to travel across the galaxy, they would have to live beyond their natural lifespan. To achieve this, it would be necessary to create humans that had been biologically modified. At a secret conference in November 2001, a group representing a range of disciplines, science, the arts, religion, philosophy, and the military, debated the moral and pragmatic implications of making contact with aliens. We need to make plans for lots of different strategies, defusing situations, protecting ourselves, uh, as paranoid as it sounds. It's a, a presumably cultured species of some sort. We've never found one before. We have never had the need to communicate with one before. And the, the goal is to find these people and communicate with them and find out something about their mode of intelligence and their mode of living their lives. Like the media, they too began to speculate on the appearance of the aliens. But government officials knew their efforts to decode the extraterrestrial message would be wasted without new telescopes that could receive a much clearer signal. They asked us what we wanted, and we said 73 100-meter telescopes all grouped together, which is an extraordinary collecting area. 
and we got it. It, it was like Christmas. Prior to 1997, it was only a few million dollars a year. It was just an extraordinary turnaround. By the spring of 2002, the new telescope building program, which continues to this day, had begun. The European Union now also began construction of a telescope, as did Japan's massive Sekai Corporation. But these projects paled beside the U.S. effort. And yet, across America, opposition was growing. Hey, enough tax as it is already just to keep the economy going. Uh, uh, I, I just want to see some results. You're listening to The Jack Bingley Show. Radio stations reported a flood of calls, some supportive, but many angry about the high taxes needed to build telescopes. See, what I wonder is how ordinary people are supposed to know... Just how stupid do they think we are? There hasn't been one shred of hard evidence to prove that these aliens actually exist, you know? Yet, yeah, we're supposed to... And the government knows it. If you want to know what the government is really up to, just look at history. Everybody knows the American economy and the world economy uh, is in one hell of a mess. It helps them get more money for research, more of our tax dollar. But doesn't actually do any of us ordinary folk any good at all. As confusion grew throughout 2002, more and more people wanted to know what the existence of extraterrestrials really meant to them. In his Easter address, the Pope could only report that a Vatican committee was still looking into the matter. But in America, evangelists like Dr. Reg Grant were trying to meet the need for guidance. Science is not our God. But neither is it our enemy. Science has provided us with this data, and if this data, if this data, suggests order and symmetry and design and and purpose in the signal, then it's up to us as thinking men and women to study it, to test it, to pray for wisdom. Eastern religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, which respect non-human life forms, were now finding more converts even in remote corners of America. But it was the Mormon church which proved most attractive of all. In America, membership had doubled to nine million since the discovery of the signal. As Dwayne Jeffrey and Kimball Hansen explain, the reason lay in the very nature of Mormon doctrine. The Mormon church, since the time of its organization in 1830, has always harbored a belief that there would be planets elsewhere in the universe that are inhabited by intelligent life. That idea is celebrated both in Mormon songs, music, and in scripture. Indeed, an early Mormon scripture presents a conversation of God with the prophet Moses. And worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by the word of my power, and there are many that now stand, and innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. By September 2002, America had spent billions of dollars on new telescopes that were finally able to receive the signal in its full detail. They enabled scientists to confirm that the signal was actually a picture, made up of a grid of dots. But they still couldn't make out what the picture was. It was frustrating. We had all the equipment that we wanted. We were getting the signal perfectly. And uh, what we read was a bunch of dots. It was, um, it was like if you were running home to watch the football game and someone cut the cable and all you were reading was snow. But there was something else about the signal that now worried the astronomers, something they would have preferred to keep to themselves. The frequency of the signal was varying, but not in the manner we would normally associate with a planet spinning on its axis. 
unless, of course, you were viewing the planet pole on, which is highly unlikely. It's also not the sort of frequency change we would normally associate with a planet spinning around its sun. The obvious implication of this was that the transmitter was moving, but was not on a planet. From the beginning, the Pentagon feared the signal might originate from a spaceship heading towards Earth. Now, this new information sent shockwaves through the military. Their anxiety grew when four weeks later their early warning systems detected an unexplained object in orbit, 14,000 miles out in space. They eventually concluded that this was no more than a piece of space debris, but not before US forces had been put on full alert. A few days later, information about the military's false alarm was obtained by the press and something close to panic ensued. It was during this period of intense anxiety that Cheryl Davis heard again from her elusive informant. I'd been collecting documents over the previous months under the Freedom of Information Act, trying to get more evidence on the alleged infrared signal that they'd gotten at Roswell. When he calls up, and it's that same familiar voice, and all he did was leave an address for a motel in Albuquerque, and he asked that Bill or I meet him there. The caller's identity is still a mystery. Gregory went to the motel where he met one of the most influential men in America's military history. There, once and for all, he heard the full story of what happened at Roswell and why the government had been so secretive. When Cheryl called, I'd pretty much given up on the Roswell tip-off, so I really didn't know what to expect when I pulled into that motel. I sure as hell didn't expect Major Alexander. As Davis and Gregory knew, retired Air Force Major Howard Alexander had been involved with the formation of... I must confess that I felt somewhat ridiculous setting. I was under strict orders not to disclose this information to anyone. Alexander confirmed to Gregory the extraordinary truth about Roswell a Project Mogul balloon had picked up an extraterrestrial signal. But Alexander also finally revealed why the government had kept their discovery a secret for all these years. In the late 40s and 50s, he explained, there was already tremendous public concern about alien beings and UFOs. We are your friends. We are your friends. This made the government deeply nervous about how people might react to news of a real extraterrestrial communication. Alexander had been a member of a secret committee in the early 50s and showed Gregory its classified report outlining the government's plans to use films, television and radio to educate people about... But according to Alexander, the committee realized their plan had backfired. As talk about extraterrestrials increased, people were becoming even less rational in their beliefs. Well, as I say, it started first with a very decided tingling all over my body. I seemed to become one with the entire universe. By the end of the 50s, we were forced to conclude that our educational efforts had not produced the results that we were after. We felt that they had done nothing more than feed the public appetite for science fiction. So we were forced to conclude that if confirmed information about extraterrestrials was made public, that it would cause mass hysteria. We genuinely believe that. But in Alexander's view, the 2001 communication changed everything. He felt Roswell held the key and urged Davis and Gregory to go public. In their resulting newspaper article, they described the signal received at Roswell and the subsequent cover-up. But perhaps their most startling revelation was the claim that the ET signal had influenced the space race. The launch of Sputnik, they wrote, spread panic around the Pentagon. If the Soviets were ahead in space technology, then how was anyone to know they weren't also ahead in communication with extraterrestrials? There was really only one option for the US. Even if they found the Soviets had made ET contact, they couldn't leave it to them the space research program had to be accelerated. And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge... ...shall not 
see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom. In fact, the Soviets had not picked up the extraterrestrial signal. But the US had no way of knowing that there was never an ET gap. From 1961, the US rushed to get men into space, never telling the astronauts that they would not be alone. Davis and Gregory's article was like a bomb going off inside the military. Within two days of its publication, the Pentagon gave an official public response. Gentlemen, ladies. The Department of Defense spokeswoman began by confirming the real story of what happened at Roswell, that a Project Mogul surveillance balloon had indeed picked up a signal of extraterrestrial origin. And then she said what all astronomers wanted to hear. In light of the extraterrestrial signal received by civilian astronomers and in line with its financial and practical involvement in the research which has followed that discovery, the Department of Defense has decided to make available all records of these earlier signals in anticipation that it may assist that research process. I will not be taking any questions at this time. What's the real story, Mary? Public interest in the extraterrestrial signal, which over the months had slipped into confusion and skepticism, was now reignited by the Pentagon controversy. Congressional hearings into the Roswell cover-up began one month later, drawing higher television ratings than the O.J. Simpson trial eight years earlier. International outrage followed. Some members of the United Nations called for America's expulsion from the UN on the grounds that it had been concealing vital information that was the property of humanity. Caught in the middle were American scientists, who concluded they would have to go it alone in their space research. While debate and recrimination raged, the scientists just wanted to get to work on the Roswell signal. I felt that we needed that data immediately. And, and every astronomer felt exactly the same way. Alexander and his colleagues had not been able to decode the infrared signal because they'd been mystified by its characteristics. The signals we were detecting seemed to be coming in quite regularly and in a binary code seemed to be transmitting the numerical value of pi, 3.14159, so on. This would go on for weeks on end and then abruptly stop. When they, when they recurred, we noticed a slight variation in the signal, a, a minor phase shift in the timing of the signal, a fraction of a second. This perplexed us. When tapes of the 1947 signal were finally handed to engineers Don Merrick and Greg Silverman, it was this timing shift that immediately caught their attention. The first thing we looked at when we finally got the tapes was the timing shift in the transmission, the different lengths of time it was taking the signal to spell out pi. We realized the military scientists must have been looking at the same thing because in their files we found all these strips of old chart recorder paper just kind of scotch taped together. There, uh, uh, if you look at this, you can see that, uh, that this is in fact pi. Now this would continue, but this is the beginning. And uh, they, they, they taped them together and you can see that the pulses came in at different speeds. This one, for example, uh, came in a little bit quicker than this one, which was slower. It's actually a binary code. Slower, slower, faster, slower, faster, kind of like Morse code. This was the breakthrough they had been hoping for, one that had eluded the military 50 years earlier. The timing shift was itself a code, a code made up of three numbers. Soon they made another discovery, a connection between the two signals. The moment that we found out about the infrared signal, we'd wondered if, if it wasn't some kind of beacon that was directing us to a more uh, complex signal. And in fact, this is precisely what was intended. You see, once we got the three numbers from the timing shift, we started playing around with them. We took the first number and we multiplied it by the frequency of the infrared signal. The product of those two numbers turned out to be the frequency of the radio signal. Fifty years ago, the aliens told us where to look, but nobody read the message right. 
Having found the meaning of the first number, the astronomers now went about deciphering the other two. Here they turned to the work of pioneering astronomer Frank Drake. Drake once calculated there could be thousands of civilizations in our galaxy capable of communicating with Earth. Back in 1974, he and Carl Sagan had written the only message ever sent out into space. That message is today recorded in stained glass at Drake's home in California. When Drake first began to think about communicating with extraterrestrial beings, he confronted the problem of how to write a message for someone who knows no human language. He concluded that the one language all advanced civilizations would understand is binary code, the language of ones and zeros used by computers. To test his theory, he created a message in binary code containing basic information about human civilization. Then he sent it to some of his colleagues. Every astronomer remembers Drake's experiment for one simple reason. No one could successfully decode it. They failed to realize the message was based on two prime numbers, 19 and 29. Once that was understood, the 551 characters in the message became clear. What Frank Drake was hoping that his colleagues would realize was that it, with 29 rows of 19 characters each, the ones represented by black squares, the zeros represented by white squares, that what you get is a, is a, a picture. And of course the picture needs further interpretation, but once you have a picture, you know that you're onto something. Scientists knew the extraterrestrials had used binary code in their first message. They also knew that message still contained two mystery numbers. Was the first message telling us how to read the second? Using Drake's principle, the scientists arranged the 2001 signal into rows and columns, indicated by the two numbers from the earlier message. And what emerged was a picture, but one unlike anything they'd ever seen. momentous discovery, astronomers finally reveal the face behind the signal from space. Yeah, I hope they're friendly. See ya. When finally the time came, the decoded signal was broadcast for all the world to see attracting the largest audience for one television event ever. The picture the aliens had been sending was of themselves, a self-portrait. Yet this was not a picture of any kind of creature, at least not in the biological sense of the word. What all these strange symbols showed was the internal organization of a highly complex machine. The thing I want to know is you know, who made the computers and, and what, what, you know, what are they going to do to us? And you know, if, they, if they're out of computers and they're advanced, more advanced than we are, right? And so I'm wondering, you know, we've, got to, we've got to hurry up, we've got to wake up. It's, it's scary. I have kids. I have, you know. You seem like a lot more intelligent, a lot more immortal. I don't see why they wouldn't come here after sort of letting themselves be known to us. And that makes me nervous. What else is, what else is there to this message? Today, we're two, maybe three generations away from designing truly intelligent machines. Now, it only stands to reason that if we can do this, other civilizations out there have already done it. Maybe a million, maybe a billion years ago. Now, if you create a truly intelligent machine, one of the first jobs you're going to give that machine is to design a more intelligent successor to itself, thus setting off a new sort of evolution, a machine evolution. And with a force like that in place, it's only a matter of time before good old flesh and blood starts to look rather beside the point. As telescopes continued to track the signal, they confirmed its source was definitely on the move, though still over a hundred trillion miles away. During their evolution, these machines must have abandoned their biological creators and become galactic explorers. The scientists were adamant the machines were too far away to be a threat. 
Yet sensational press reports were already creating alarm. And the question remained, what did these aliens want? This question's always been waiting for us at the end of this vigil. What sort of motive can we ascribe to a civilization that would send out this sort of signal? If they had been a biological civilization like our own, we might well consider the possibility that this was an aggressive move, as very much uh, our exploration has been. But as we know that this is a machine intelligence, for all of the philosophizing and all the reasoning that we do, we can't answer that question about what motivates this civilization, at least not now. The best science can do is say, we don't know. Don't you sometimes regret getting the signal? Not for a moment. Curiosity is hardwired into the human animal. If there are questions out there that need answers, we're programmed to look for those answers. It's what makes us human. It's what we're all about. The world's curiosity had been unleashed, and for the first time, astronomers now had the resources to hear the true sound of the stars. On July the 6th, 2003, they reaped their reward, discovering another brand new signal. Days later came another, then more. In fact, over 20 different signals by the time this film was made. When we finally began really to listen to the galaxy, we found it teeming with life. It was as if for centuries we had been in our own little house with the doors and windows closed. And now, as we threw them open, we heard the chatter of voices all around us. It was a discovery so humbling that public anxiety and fear finally dissipated. The UN ended their bickering and agreed to send out a signal in reply to add our welcome to the voices of space. And that is why we are transmitting to you this signal, with its plea for friendship, its encyclopedia of our planet, and, by way of explanation, this simple film. The film you have just seen has not happened. But could something like this really occur? Here's what the real-life experts think. For decades, the American military has been searching the skies, looking for signals from the Soviet Union. And in particular, they were interested in detecting Soviet nuclear explosions. Now, in 1947, they might well have been searching the skies using infrared to look for the glow of a nuclear explosion. And they might have detected by accident an infrared signal from another civilization, because we know that infrared is capable of transmitting information across the distances between stars. Should we expect other civilizations to be sending us messages in the binary code? Well, it makes a lot of sense. When we code with the binary code, it makes messages stand out, makes them easily detectable. But more importantly, the binary code is the simplest arithmetic system. And so when you use it, the message is most easily decoded, most easily understood. What the extraterrestrial civilization would do is try to start out with a beacon signal that would be easy to detect. And one way to do this would be to send out a simple signal like the number pi that any civilization in the universe would know about if they're smart enough to build radio transmitters or receivers. So I think the first thing that will happen is we'll detect this kind of a beacon. Then after that, what will probably happen is we'll find that there's another signal there, a more subtle signal that's harder to detect, but it contains much more complex information. If we pick up a signal, is there any chance the signal is coming not from a biological creature, but from machine intelligence as portrayed in this film? I think that there is a possibility. In fact, I think it's a probability. Uh, we're biological, so we tend to assume that they will be too. But once you've developed machine intelligence, then those machines can improve themselves very rapidly. They're not bound by Darwinian evolution, after all. And machines can travel through space. It's not dangerous for them. Uh, they can spread out. They can use the resources they find everywhere. They can carry vast amounts of, of information. 
So, you know, if we find a signal, of course that signal will be coming. ...occurring that are being obviously deliberately transmitted, and um, that could only be, you know, intelligent life forms on another planet, um, aliens, if you will. On July the 23rd, the SETI astronomers were just beginning a new space survey based at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. Signal engineer Dr. Don Merrick was working at the telescope in the early hours of the morning. I remember that it was uh, very late. It was about 3 a.m. Uh, we had just repositioned the telescope. And uh, I got a, a peek out of the noise uh, signal coming through on my, my station. Um, now, this is not so unusual. It happens, you know, fairly often. The standard procedure is to confirm it with another telescope. Merrick contacted fellow astronomers in Massachusetts. Now two sets of scientists were tuned into the same frequency. And it was about a half hour later, I got an email that said something like, uh, what the hell is that? And, um, you know, and that's when I knew that we had something remarkable. They knew the signal had to be taken seriously and began standard tests to make sure it was genuine. They moved their telescopes away from the frequency, and the signal disappeared. They brought them back, and the signal returned. Then the computers were checked for faults. Everything was working. At that point, I contacted my colleagues, and they contacted the Owens Valley Observatory in California and the Arecibo uh, Telescope in Puerto Rico, which is the largest in the world. Um, we asked them to tune in the same frequency, and uh, the information came back positive. They, uh, they had the same signal. And I hadn't slept in days, and I was uh, wide awake, I can tell you that. With three different telescopes receiving the same signal from the same point in the sky and showing no natural characteristics, astronomers were convinced the message was extraterrestrial. Email went out to the top scientists in the field, but no one knew what the signal was saying. Web pages. I know the scientific community says they intended all along to give the public this information, but I don't buy it. You know, these guys, politicians, scientists, they've lied to us before. They'll lie to us again. They're not about to stop. As soon as the hackers began spreading the email around the internet, it was picked up by the military. A short time later, SETI astronomer Ben Klatsky received a call from the Pentagon. When they first called, uh, they said that they'd heard that we'd received some interesting signals and asked if we were willing to confirm, all pretty low-key. And then they wanted to know, uh, did we know how far away the signals were coming from? And if they were coming from something moving, uh, say a spaceship, uh, I'm sure national security was their concern. But I told them just to relax and wait for our press conference. The astronomers knew they had to go public fast with their discovery, or someone else would. None of the telescopes were sensitive enough to read it clearly. The scientists were reluctant to go public with their news, but events were already overtaking them. I think that under ideal circumstances, we would have worked on that signal for some time. But within a few days, the news leaked out. And as you know, in a computer age, it's virtually impossible to keep anything a secret. One of the most startling discoveries of the century. And the source of the leak was two computer hackers in San Francisco who'd entered a local university network. An avalanche of email among astronomers was their clue that something was up. We were hacking into these university internet accounts, reading their emails, and we came across these string of messages between these radio astronomers. And these guys were jazzed about something. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. So I took these messages and I propagated them across the internet into different this film was made in the year 2003. As a new millennium dawns for planet Earth, we look back on the events which finally unlocked a mystery that has haunted humankind since time began.
July 2001. Radio astronomers from the SETI Society, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, were combing the sky for signs of alien life. Armed with radio telescopes, SETI scientists scanned the vast reaches of space, hoping to detect a deliberate signal of some kind amid all the cosmic noise. Senior scientist, Professor Jane Lascelles. A radio telescope basically works like an enormous antenna and it uh, is searching the galaxy for radio waves. And um, these radio waves are caused by an enormous number of naturally occurring phenomena. But the search for extraterrestrial intelligence focuses on radio signals that are not naturally